Let's go with this message today. It's the third in a four-part series called The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Where do we get the four horsemen of the apocalypse? We get them right out of the book of Revelation. So it's not something we made up or somebody else made up. It's right in the Bible. And so we're going to continue today with this third one. And just a smidgen of review to get us set where we need to go. Amen? But it won't take long. Here we go. Quickly. The word apocalypse and the word revelation mean the same what? Thing. So both words mean exactly the same thing. The word apocalypse and revelation means to unveil and reveal things to come. So when you look at the book of Revelation, you're going like, well, my goodness, this is what's going to come in the future. Amen? So that's what this is all about. The first horseman of the apocalypse, is, this, this is not the whole book of Revelation. This is just Revelation chapter number 6 with, with some cor- corresponding Scriptures in the rest of the Bible, but also some in Revelation. But this is just a tidbit of what's going to be happening. It's just another picture of end time events that we can look at. The first horseman of the apocalypse is the white horse, and I believe represents deception, specifically in the person and spirit of the Antichrist. That first part of Revelation chapter 6, we've already discussed this. I saw and behold a white horse. He that sat on him had a bow. A crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. I do not believe this is Jesus on the horse. Some people do. I believe this is the Antichrist. I believe he conquers with diplomacy and making of a false peace treaty with the Middle East and the nation of Israel. Let's keep looking. Through his charisma... The Antichrist will gain world recognition. The Antichrist will be a man. Okay, Chaotic world conditions will call for such a leader. He will be propelled to the top. I suggest to you right now today, our world's clamoring for such a leader. To fix this mess over in the Middle East. Under his leadership, he will bring what seems to be a real peace treaty to the Middle East. He did it! It's over! They're coming home! It's going to be great! Who wouldn't cheer and get on the bandwagon? That's what's going to happen. The second horse from the apocalypse we looked at last week is not the white horse anymore, it's the red horse, which I believe represents dissension and war. We made the case for that last week. We can't remake the case, okay? Revelation 6.3, when it opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. Power was given unto him that sat thereon to take what? Peace from the earth. And that they should do what? Kill one another. Sounds like a war to me. And there was given unto him a great what? Sword. And so, we laid that out. Somewhere around the middle of the tribulation period, the what seems to be like a peace in the Middle East is going to be broken. And all hell is going to break loose. And an open and unbelievably hostile war will break out as never seen before on this planet. End times. Last days. Okay, that's what we've been talking about. There should be no doubt among thinking people, not even talking about Bible people now, just thinking people, about the possibility of an all-out catastrophic war as prophesied in the Bible. I don't even think, I don't think you could find people on the street if you ask them, do you think a war, a big, big, bad war could break out in the Middle East? I don't think you'll find anybody that'll go, no. Not anymore, do you? Yes or no? No. They got their head in the sand. They ain't never watched news, lifted the radio over the last six years or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, this is going to happen. It will happen, but when? Okay? When's this going to happen? We don't know, but Jesus said it this way. His disciples asked these questions, and here's how he responded. Look at it Matthew 24, verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, Jesus there sitting, the disciples came unto him privately, just them and him said, tell us when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? And here's what Jesus said. He said, take heed that no man deceive you. I believe that's the Antichrist. Many shall come in My name, saying, I am Christ, and deceive many. Verse 6, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Say it with me. And there shall be what? Famines and pestilences and earthquakes in different places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. So, that leads us today to our third message. And that is the black horse. So y'all cool so far? 
How many remembered sort of what we said? If you were here, you sort of clued in. Great, all right, that's good. Amen. Because I half forget. That's awesome. Here we go. The black horse. Say that red word with me there at the bottom. Devastation. Devastation. Deception. Dissension. Devastation. Today, as we look at this black horse. Devastation. And it's, just, it's, it's common sense that if all this happens, there's going to be what on the earth? Devastation. People are going to be what? Devastated. All right. The third horseman of the apocalypse is the black horse, which I believe represents devastation and famine. And it's not just me that believes this. A lot of scholars, but, and I don't consider myself a scholar, but conservative thinkers believe exactly what I'm telling you today when they read the Scriptures. Okay? So let's look at this black horse today and see what we can find. Revelation chapter 6, if you have your Bible, follow along with us. But every Scripture I talk about is going to be on the screen. Might quote a couple, but most of them are going to be right here. Revelation chapter 6, verse 5. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard what? The third beast say. And we're going to look at this beast in a little bit. We ain't been looking at these beasts, but we're going to look at them today. Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, what kind of horse? A, help me now, black horse. And he that sat on him had a what? A pair of balances in his hand. Just like you see there. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny. See that you hurt not the oil and the wine. What in the world is all of that? <laughs> well, we're going to break it down today, and we're going to look at it. Let's learn something today. I hope that we can. As a result of the horrible bloodshed that's going to take place due to the war that we've talked about, this war of wars in the last days, devastation will naturally follow. And Roger's got some pictures that you'll be seeing as well. This war will not only kill millions of men, women, and children, but it will also destroy valuable farmlands. It will demolish manufacturing and merchandising businesses. It's obvious. These armies will kill people. They will devastate the economy. Okay? There's just no other way around it. There's no other option here. This is only natural. Okay? It happens. A war-torn society always faces shortages of water, food, and other basic life necessities. That's why when you go and you fight a war, it's hard to bring peace because these people's lives, even though you're fighting for them, many times their lives are worse off than when you went. It seems that way because now they ain't got no water! You see what I'm saying? And it's just a mess. But this is only normal. But in a war like this, in the end times, it's going to be even more catastrophic. Famine to us in the United States look, looks like mass starvation in remote third world countries. This is what we think of. In thinking of famine, we see small children with emaciated bodies, bloated bellies with skeletal bones protruding, and flies bu buzzing around sullen, staring faces. Alright? It's hard to look very long, isn't it? Say, it's just hard. It's easier to... It's easier... Well, i got to go do something. It's hard to look at it. But not looking at it in our world today is not going to make it go away. Do you hear me? It's there. Keep looking. What's horribly sad is that in many of these countries, they're often the powerful and elite group of rulers who hoard the nation's wealth and resources while sitting fat and happy as the masses perish. Is that true, yes or no? And it happens. And the same kind of things are going to happen in the last days. I think we're just seeing images and glimpses of these things that's going to be right before. So what I'm telling you today, you might be that guy crazy talking about some famine in the end time. Folks, there's a famine now. Wake up. It just ain't at your house. Okay? It might not be in America. But our world, many people are in famine. They're in need. Keep looking. Famine, we don't know much about it. Can you say that with me? Famine. We don't know much about it. One more time. Famine. We don't know much about it. Now what do I mean? Well, what do you mean? I can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with most of you on growing up in a hard life. Amen? I can grow up talking about we didn't have anything and we grew vegetables and that's all we had to eat. You know what I'm saying? I grew up without meat. There was a while in our life we ate mustard sandwiches. White bread with mustard on it. You know what? My brother is well off today. He still likes mustard sandwiches. The guy's crazy. What's wrong with you? White bread, baby. Sunbeam bread. 
And what kind of mustard? Frenches. <laughs> you know? But I'm saying, I could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you probably. Not all of you. Maybe some of you had a little harder. But the point is, that ain't famine. Are y'all listening? Say. Let's talk about when you didn't have water for three weeks to drink or something. Amen? Let's talk about when you had nothing and they came from another country and they had to mix this slop in a little bowl and you ate it and that's all you got for till the next day. It was paste. What I'm saying is, we don't know, do we? Really. We see the pictures. We hear about it. We don't know. So I'm going to introduce you to some of it. Here we go. Some famine facts. And, and, and Alex got me lots of stuff. He found me lots of documentation. And I just sort of went through it. This ain't long. I think you'll get the gist. There are 6.5 billion people in the world today. I bet, bet, bet some of you didn't even know how many people in the world today. You know, because I don't keep a count every day, do you? There's 6.5 billion, actually there's about 6.6 .6 billion people in the world today. Over 800 million of these 6.5 billion are malnourished. They're starving to death. Today. That's a lot of people, isn't it? Say, three times the size of the United States about. Wouldn't you call that a lot of starving people? Say. Alright, keep looking. 16,500 children under the age of five die every day because of malnourished. That's 16,500 that die every single day. We're not talking about six-year-olds. We're talking about just under five. There are also six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's Young people, teenagers, there's elderly. But just to those little kids, 16,500 die every day. That's 688 children die every hour. There's no famine going on. You're crazy. There's a famine in our world. It's going on now. It's going to be worse during the time that is prophesied in the Scripture. That number, 688, is about 700 an hour. Every minute. That's about ten kids, ain't it? Is that right? Something like that? Every minute. Every minute. Every minute. Every minute. See, we don't know a lot about it, do we? Say. We don't know what it's like, do we? We don't experience that. The number one reason for hunger and malnourishment is poverty. It's the number one reason. Why? They ain't got no money to buy the something to eat. And you send money to some of these places. Not all. Thank God there are many good organizations. Thank God. And that's most of them Christian because of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. But listen, but you, you send the money and don't get to where it's supposed to go. Poverty. Number one reason. More than one billion. Boy, you need to get this. And if we got any ungrateful people that run around here griping and moaning, we're, pff, we ain't going to put up with it. Are you listening? More than one billion people live on less than a dollar a day in our world. There's only how many people in the world? 6.5 billion. One b -b -b billion of them live on less than a dollar a day. Can you imagine that? Say, famine. I mean, I know this is a hard message. It's hard, but you know what? The church needs to hear it. 60% of the world's population, get this, 60% of the world's population lives on 5% of the world's income. Did you get that? There's 95% of the income going to 45% of the people. 60% of the world live on 5%. 5% of the world's income. You think 5% of the world's income can feed 60% of the people? Yes or no? No. The math ain't there, people. Okay? The other 40% of the world live on the remaining 95%. Let's put it in perspective. About 4 billion people live on 5%. 2.5 billion live on 95%. And I'm not making an indictment to people. That's not what this message is about. I'm just trying to make you see. There's already a famine. Can you say that with me? There's already a, a famine. See, I think that's what... When I look at end time events, I look at the wars raging in the Middle East, you know... I look at the call for leadership to bring peace. I hear these things and see it on the news. You do just like I do. I look and I see. If I'm not careful, I won't see the famine. I won't see it. 
And so I bring it to your attention today so you'll know these could be nearing the last days. Amen? Why? Why can I say that? Because all these things are prevalent right now. We can see these things. Do I know if it's the end time? I don't know. I think I'm commanded, I believe in Scripture, to live as if Jesus could come today. We're only promised today. We don't know what we got tomorrow. It's the only day we got. We need to live as if He could come today. So let's go now to the Scripture. And I want to lay this out quickly. And our time is good, believe it or not, today. Here we go. Let's understand this verse and let's see what we can do. Pastor, what are you trying to do to us? Kill us here? Amen? My, the people I know that start churches, 9 out of 10 new churches fail. I keep all that remembering that in my mind. But uh, they'll tell you, ooh, you've got to preach now always positive. You've got to say them nice things, you know. You know you can't, it's more seeker-friendly now. You can't push people away. These kind of messages have a way of pushing people away. Because they're not pleasant. But if this pushes you away, guess what? That's your problem. That's not my problem. If showing you faces of hungry people and hurting people and letting you know these could very well be the end times is going to push you away, then you've got a bigger problem than Gary Clark. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'd hang in here and I'd take it. And I'd listen today. And I believe we'll get some help. Joy will tell me what little speech I just gave my imaginary friend showed up. I just fought with him. I'm starting to understand where you're coming from now. He just shows up out of the blue and I go crazy. Is that what you're trying to tell me? Okay, anyway. Hey, we all have one of these little guys, don't we? Here we go. <laughs> no, we don't. I'm the only crazy one, right? Here we are. I see you're what you're doing to me. Revelation 6, 5. Let's read the verse together, these two verses. Can we say them together? And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Let's break it down. And let's look at it right now. This would be a good place if you want to take some notes or you can always go back to our website on Monday. Click on this and you can have this full PowerPoint without me in it. And you can review okay, and study. A black horse. Let's look at that. It says, there was a black horse. The word black or blackness, is found 23 times in the Bible. It describes the sky, hair, cloth, marble, skin, night, ravens, seeds, and horses. So the word black appears 23 times. Blackness seems most often to speak of, say it with me, darkness. Darkness. The ancients didn't use black like we use it today this person's white. This person's black. It wasn't, that's not what the word was used for, generally speaking. We can certainly make an observation, that person's a lighter color than that person, okay? But generally speaking, that wasn't done. And this is the, the, the word means something. Look at it. Okay? It, it meant darkness. The Israelites used blackness to signify, say it with me, the morning of Men, he, give, he gives beauty for He turned my mourning into dancing. Mourning, not M O R N I N G, like the sun's coming up this morning. M O U R N I N G. I'm heavy, I'm weeping, I'm sad, I'm depressed, I am oppressed. The Israelites use this word blackness to signify mourning, usually in the scriptures, due to scarcity or want or famine. I just want to tell you this. That's how awesome your Bible is. God is so detailed. If we would quit arguing with the Bible and start seeing that the Bible is true, and it's not only true, it is so accurate. Even right down to the word, the etymology of a word. You'd be surprised what it can do for you. You just start totally trusting in God's Word and believing it, man. And that's the word that's used here in this passage. So there's no question there's going to be famine in the end times. Look at a couple of Scriptures in the Old Testament that make the point. Judah mourneth, and the gates thereof languish. They are black unto the ground. The cry of Jerusalem is gone up. Here's another Scripture. Lamentations. Our skin was black like an oven. Why? Because of the terrible what? Famine. Look at our bodies. 
Look at our face. Look at our we're dark because we have nothing to eat. You understand? This is a this is a last days prophecy in Joel chapter two. It's interesting how it goes along with the one we're seeing now in Revelation. The appearance of them is as the appearance of what? Horses. And as horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains, shall they leap like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. Look at this next verse. Before their face, the people shall be much pain. Say it with me. All faces shall gather what? Blackness. So do you understand a little better what that word black means? It means darkness. It's used most often in our Bible to speak of scarcity or want or famine or hunger. A person who has nothing to eat is in darkness. Can you imagine living your life like that? How bright would your day be if you get up and there's nothing to eat? You've got a family, you've got nothing to eat. Can there be anything more dark than that? Say, that's what this is speaking of. The black horse. Keep looking. Let's go a step further. So it's a black horse, and then the horseman is holding a pair of what? Balances in his hand. Okay? What's that mean? Black horse, with understanding famine, darkness, scarcity, want. A pair of balances in his right hand. Let's look at this scale deal. The Greek word is zugon, which literally means yoke, as in the yoke of an oxen. The word actually... It comes from that thing right there that's across that neck. You see that thing? Couldn't you easily see two pans on that and it becomes a scale, doesn't it? Say, are you seeing that? Amen? That's the idea. That's where this word comes from. It's like that beam of balance that's on those oxen that's across the oxen. And that's where it is. That's what it is. That's what a scale is. On each side of this beam or bar, a scale would have a pan in which the contents are to be weighed. How many ever remember, some of you old timers remember going into shops and things like that, and they would have little weights and things like that, and you would buy stuff with the weights. Can I see your hand just so that the young folks can know that I'm not crazy up here? See kids, that's the way it used to be. Alright, let's keep looking. From ancient times till about a hundred years ago, and some of you aren't a hundred years old that raised your hand, sorry. The value or quality of things were weighed on scales. That's how they did it. Food, seeds, supplies, they were weighed on scales. And they would weigh this stuff on scales, listen to me, and how they weighed that out, that would tell you how much money you had to pay. See? They traded on weight, they used currency, but it was all about the weight of things. Does that make sense to you? Times have changed, man. Keep looking. People bought or sold items by weight or measure, not based on currency like today. The weight would be what drove the engine. The money you'd pay according to the weight. Does that make sense to you? That's the way it was when John received this prophecy. He spoke that way. And quite frankly, up until, like I said, probably even 50 years ago, it was common English and plain. Everybody understood it clear as a whistle. That's what this is talking about. Keep looking. But what does it mean? Keep looking. When scales are mentioned in measuring bread, especially in the Bible, it's a symbol of scarcity. Why? Because bread would normally be sold by the what? Loaf, not exact weight. Well, I'd like a pound of bread. That's not normally the way it works. It was a loaf of bread. But this, this Scripture, keep, don't let me lose you because it, it's getting a little crazy, but watch it. During a famine, however, each ounce of flour would be extremely valuable. Does that make sense? And rationed by weight or measure. That's a clue that this is a famine, not just blackness, and it, because it speaks of blackness and, and famine and scarcity and want, but also this, these balances, these scales give us an idea that this is going to be a time of tremendous famine and scarcity. Look at a couple of Scriptures where this is the case in in the Bible. Leviticus 26.26 And when I have broken the staff of your bread, the women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall deliver you your bread again by what? Wait, and you shall eat and not be what? See, you're measuring it by weight, and you ain't getting a whole lot. You're going to starve. Okay? Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, Ezekiel 4.16, Behold, I will break the staff of bread in Jerusalem, and they shall eat bread by what? Wait, 
and with care, and they shall drink water. Look at that. By measure and with astonishment. Can you imagine if all you got was an 8-ounce cup of water a day? We're measuring your water now. Here's your water. Here's your little bread. It ain't enough. And that's what you have to eat on. We don't even know what that's like, do we, people? Say. I'm telling you, what are messages? Why do I preach crazy messages like this? Well, because everybody making a big deal about Halloween, get scared all out here. There's plenty in the Bible that ought to get your attention. That ought to wake you up about end times and last days. And that's why I like to talk like this. I think that's why it's in the Scriptures. It behooves us to not live selfishly. Not live as if we got every day. We're going to keep living. There, this world that we live in one day is going to come to an end. <laughs> Jesus will come again. I don't know if it's going to be in my lifetime. But man, I ought to be focused. I ought to do better. I ought to think these things through. And that's why I bring this to your attention. And I hope it's making sense. It's done it for me because I've been studying it all week. So let's look at this now. So we got a black horse, we got some scales, and then we got this statement, this crazy statement. What's this mean? A measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. A measure is equal to our what? Quart. Matter of fact, if you have a newer translation, it might say quart right in your Bible. Okay? It means a quart. A penny, a measure of flour, or a quart of flour for a penny. A quart of flour for a penny. A penny was the Roma denarius, which was equal to an entire day's wage. So let's interpret the Scripture now. A quart of flour will cost how much? A day's wage! And a quart is the amount that a normal man needs to survive. Are y'all listening? Sound like a famine to me. You hearing me? Okay? Can you imagine working all day, all day, all day just to get a little bit of flour to mix with some water so that you could get up tomorrow and work all day, all day, all day so you could have a little flour and a little water so that you could get up and work all... That'd be pretty rough, wouldn't it? In Roman times, a day's wage would buy eight quarts of wheat. And trust me, they didn't have the times that we have, the money and the finances that we have like we have right now. That was good, man. You could buy eight days of food and one day's of work. Amen? Say, next day you go to work, now you're buying something, maybe get you some meat. Next day you're going to get you something. You see what I'm saying? Next day you can buy. But not, not in the end times. You could buy 24 quarts of barley, which is not as good as flour, healthy as flour, supposedly. And it'll be cheaper. Okay? So... In, in Roman times, you could buy 24 quarts of barley on a day's wage, but not during this time. Keep looking. Imagine bread costing $16 to $20 a loaf, say. That's what the math is here. $16 to $20 a loaf. So you can see how our wages are a lot more than their wages were, right? Say. We don't live on $20 a day. I'm sure there are some in our country. There are some in our country that, that that's it, it is it. $20 a day. Social Security. They don't have a whole lot. You see what I'm saying? People like that be devastated. Hurt not the oil and the wine. What does that mean? Hurt not the oil and wine. That's all in this Scripture. More expensive food items will not be in short supply because most people ain't going to be able to afford them. Hey, let me tell you something. If you've got a lot of money right now, there are a lot of houses you can go buy. Amen, Mr. Real Estate people in the building? You see what I'm saying? But if money is in short supply or you're watching your money, it doesn't matter how many things are for sale, right? Say. I mean, all the boats can be on the lot, but unless you've got the money to buy the boat, you ain't getting the boat. So, the deal with the oil and wine. Though oil and wine pro provide additional nutritional value, they were always staples in the Middle Eastern diet and are today. An average man will spill all he, spend all he has on flour just so he can eat some bread. Are you all depressed with me? I got no happy faces. This ain't a happy face message. The black horse. Shouldn't we want to tell people about Jesus? Say. Shouldn't we want people to avoid this? Shouldn't we want people to avoid the tribulation period? Shouldn't we want people to, to get their sins forgiven and know what it is to be in heaven, be with Jesus? See, that's the motivation. Well, I'm the rest. Well, why don't you let that thing kick you square in the tail and start sharing your testimony and your faith and, and believe in getting the Gospel out? Amen? So that's why we're talking like this. I heard the third beast say, I haven't talked a lot about each beast, but in the first 
seal, the Antichrist, it was a beast, and then the second was a beast, and here's a beast. So when he had opened a third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see, look at Revelation 4, 7. tells us the different beasts that are speaking. And, and they're symbols seemingly. Look, the first beast was like a lion. It's interesting, the Antichrist will be like a ruler, a king, that kind of leadership. And a lion is, is known as the what of the jungle? The king. And then you see the second beast was like a what? Calf introduced war. A calf is used to slaughter. And that's what will happen. There will be a slaughter on this planet. And the third beast, interesting, had the face of a what? Man, pop it. You can't do any better with famine than show a face, can you? Say, I can tell you all that I'm telling you today, but I can pop some faces up. And you'll see famine. Famine had a human face. I just want us to look at some famine. Boy, your Bible has it right when it has this beast introducing famine. Famine has a human face. This will be a horrible time to be on planet earth. Are y'all listening to me say? Well, I'm a good guy. I can go to heaven my way. You better be changing your thinking. Amen? Pilate thought he had power over Jesus. Caiaphas, the high priest, thought he had power over Jesus. Jesus said, neither of you have power over me. I lay down my life because I want to lay down my life. Some of us live our life thinking we have power over salvation. I'll do good. I'll go to heaven. I'll do this. I'll go to heaven. That ain't how it works. You believe on Jesus Christ, He says in John 1.12, and He gives you the power to become the sons of God. Even to them that do what? Believe on His what? Name. Okay? I'm telling you, you don't want to go through this. Well, what does all this have to do with me now? And we're done, and we're going to fly through this. Amos 8, 11, and 12, Behold, the days are going to come, say the Lord, that I'll send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst of water, but a hearing of the Word of the Lord. The hearing of the Word of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from north even to east. They shall run to and fro to seek the Word of the Lord and shall not find it. You are so blessed, not because I'm your preacher, but you're blessed where there is a church that teaches God's Word. Amen? Even if I am off the wall and goofy. The fact of the matter is, we have the Word of God. You keep hearing me repeat it. Say it. Preach it. Put it on the screen. Why? Because that's how you eat. You hear me? That's how you eat spiritually. I got a letter from a lady this week. Wonderful letter. She told me she's growing in the Lord. She's growing faster than she's ever can remember. Now she's receiving the Word of God. It's not about me. It's about if you preach the Word of God, people can grow. They can eat. You amen? Our famine ain't that we ain't got food on our table. Our famine's that we're not hearing God's Word. We're not reading God's Word. We're not getting God's Word inside of us. And we're starving to death. And the church is dying today. 4% of people now in America, 4% say that they're, they, they come from solid evangelical Bible teaching churches where they believe the Word of God is the, is the authority of the Word of God. Isn't that crazy? You'll hear these figures like 80% say they're Christians. Yeah, but how many of them believe the Bible's the Word of God and they're active and they're going to church and they're taking it in and they're eating? About 4%. That reminds me of that 60%. Of the world's living on 5%. Sounds like our church today. Y'all listening, say. Alright? A famine in the land of hearing the words of the Lord. So what does this speak to me now? I've got to get personal with you before we leave. Darkness or light? Which characterizes you? Are you in blackness today? Are you in darkness today because you don't know Jesus Christ? You're not in the light if you don't know Jesus. Where are you at today? Are you saved? Are you a Christian today? Or when God looks at you, does He see, see that one? He says, that one right there is starving to death. That one right there is starving to death at Fellowship Church because that one's not in me. That one's not a Christian. That one can't eat. It's just a matter of time. Where are you at today? Darkness or light? Which characterizes your life? John 3.19, Jesus told Nicodemus, He said, light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light. What do you love? Do you love Jesus today? I can't do that. People will make fun of me. 
Do you love Jesus today? Are you in darkness or light? Are you starving to death? Have you been transported from darkness into light? Brethren, you're not in darkness that this day, these end times should overtake you as a thief. If you're in Christ, it's not going to overtake you like a thief. Amen? Ephesians, you were sometimes darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Hallelujah. Amen? What are you today? You can only answer that question. Number two, a pair of scales. We talked about it. How do you measure up spiritually today? Say, don't believe the lie. There's a giant pair of scales in heaven. If your good works that way, your bad works, you get in. The scales ain't in heaven. The scales are here. How are you measuring up now in your spiritual life? How are you measuring up spiritually? There was a guy in the Scripture, and it just reminded me of this. He was a, he was a, a, a king. He had a feast. He, offered, I mean, he brought vessels that were dedicated to God out and was a drunken fool. And while he was drunk as a skunk and partying like a, a, an idiot, he saw a handwriting on the wall. How many have ever heard that saying before? No handwriting on the wall! came right from the Bible. There was a hand that was writing on the wall. And it was writing, many, many, tekel you farce. And here's what it said. The interpretation, many, God has numbered the kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you're weighed in the balances or the scales and you've been found wanting, Jack. Perry's, your kingdom's divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And, it, and that night he was dead. He died and Darius the Median took over the kingdom being about three score and two years old. Here's the point. How you doing spiritually? Amen? There's a God in heaven and we're going to give an account to Him. What's our life? Where are we at? The Bible says, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we're stubborn and we continue to live in our sin and we won't live for Him, payday is coming. You hearing me? Where are you at? <laughs> you know what I mean? Is there a famine in your spiritual life? Instead of eight days of flour for one day's wage, your spiritual life is one day's wage for... One day's measure of flour. Is your life full today of God? Or are you running on empty? You getting the message or not? Trying to make it practical. Wages. Wages. Remember that day's wage? Do you have money? Does money have you? Do you have money? Does money have the love of money is the root of all evil? While some covet after, they've erred from the faith. They pierced themselves through. Do you have money? Does money have you? Hey, in the end times. God has a way of making everything all catch up. <laughs> well, you got the money, but it ain't worth nothing. Right? Say, you ought to find more in your life than money. There is more to life than money. The wages have you today. Do you realize how financially blessed you are? Every good and perfect gift from above comes down from above and comes from the Father of lights, in whom is no variable, and it's neither shadow of turning. When I was in my office this week thinking, praying, working this message, one thing I hope would happen today is that all of us would not leave this building thinking we're pathetic, we're, we're whining because of what we got. Amen? When you see a message like this, don't you think God has blessed me? Say, amen? Let's praise Him this morning. Can we do that? God's blessed me. He's a great God. Amen? Listen, I hope that's... I mean, my goodness, we cannot even relate. We do not even know what famine is like. Okay? But it's going to happen. And then finally, the faces. The faces. We saw the face of a man. The faces. Do you care for people at all? Do you care for people at all? And I'm not talking about, well, Pastor, and this is a good thing. I send $20 a month, you might say, to feed the children overseas. That's a good thing. Or $100 or help people. I think it's a great thing. Try to find a good organization that really the money's getting where it's supposed to because that's what we want to do. Okay? But I'm talking about in Inglewood. Do you care for people in Inglewood? the greater Inglewood area. Do people know you care for them? You can let them know you care for them by acts of kindness. Do, people, do you see their faces? When you see the little woman and she's sitting at the restaurant and she's by herself, did you know she used to have a husband? But he's dead now. And she eats alone because that's all she has now. Do you see people like that at all? It's like just another old fart in Inglewood. Is that how you think? Say, excuse me. I don't care if you don't like it. How do you see people? Do they matter, man? Are you hearing me today? Faces, faces, faces. We don't have to just turn on TV and see this, my friend. You can look around, and I know we don't have a famine, but there's a famine of the Word of God. People around you are lost. And they're not just going to die the first death, they're going to die the second death. 
be lost forever. Faces, do you care? Do their stares matter at you? I've had it happen to me and Joy and the kids many times. An older person or a lonely person will look over at us at the family. And they'll see the family. They don't know us. All they know is there's a mom and a dad. And there's two kids and they're just... And their mind's wondering. Going back to what it's like. You see what I'm saying? Do their stares matter? Can't we go and say, how are you doing? Say. Can we do that? Say. Oh, I can't do that. Can't trust people today. You've got to get over that. How are you doing? How about something crazy? Won't you come sit with us? Well, she's a stranger. I don't even know her. Is it going to kill you? Yes or no? Say. And how about the extra mile? Buy her dinner. Pick up the tab. Or maybe you can wait till we get to this kind of mess where your money ain't worth nothing. I'd use my money now <laughs> to bless people. Encourage people, man. Do their stares matter? Can they see Jesus in your face? Say, say, say. Can they see it in your face? Can they see Him? <laughs> I go to church. If you look like this, don't tell them you come here. <laughs> Amen? Praise the Lord. Don't tell them. Can they see Jesus in you? And I'm not talking phony. I'm talking about you love the Lord. You're grateful. You know what it's going to be in the last days. You know people are suffering today. You know. And what makes that face shine is a grateful spirit. If you start to be grateful instead of whiny, it's just going to come right out of your teeth. Won't it? It will. Can they see Jesus in you? We're done. As the Father loves me, so I have loved you. Continue in my love. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends. And you are my friends. If you do what I command you, these things I command you, say it with me, that you love one another. That's our message. Would you say these four statements and we're done. I want to shine for Jesus Christ. Number two, I want to be filled with the Spirit. Number three, I want to be Grateful. And number four, I want to love others today. Amen. I know this is a rough message, but it ended on a high note. Amen. Today, let's take what's ugly. It's going to happen. And let's let it motivate us that our Savior could come at any moment. And I need to live for Him today. And people matter right now. Not just then. Today.